Hello and welcome to Don't Stop Me Now. I'm Julie Ellis and I'm sitting in today for Paula White who uh, is off on a course and she asked me if I would step in and I'm really happy to have Carol Mahoney with me today. And Carol is the founder of Unbound Growth. She is a sales coach for Harvard Business School. She's the president of the AAISP Boston chapter and author of the upcoming book, Buyer First. Welcome, Carol. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm super excited for this. I, I, I love Paula's book and I'm sad that she's not here, but we will carry on in her presence. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm so glad to get the chance to sit and chat with you. Um, I'm super excited to hear more about your work and how you work with leaders and upcoming leaders as well, and how that led you to write a book. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I think a lot of times we think of leadership as being this top down initiative. And I really think of it as being a bottom up initiative. So often we make these decisions in leadership without really realizing how it's going to affect the people down the hill from us, so to speak. Um, and so when I decided to write this book, um, I really wanted to write it for the people at the bottom of the hill, the people who are on the front lines having conversations with buyers and prospects and customers. And how do you put them first in all things? And so it's something that unfortunately for a lot of leadership and a lot of companies, they create some of the problems that they're trying to solve for. And it usually starts with where their focus is. And if their focus isn't on their buyer and their customer first and always, then that impacts the people who are trying to have the conversations because the decisions that are getting made actually put roadblocks up in front of them to be able to be buyer first. And so this is a book for business owners who've tried everything to get more customers. They've read all of the books, they've done all of the workshops and the trainings and the podcasts. And what they don't realize that it's actually their mindset that is getting in the way of them being able to execute on these things and get more customers. And the way that companies kind of create these problems is that they create these policies and these processes that make it really difficult as an individual contributor in a company or as a small business owner to be able to focus on the things that matter. And that thing is your buyer. I um, have this, this saying that I like to go by that's the, called the new golden rule, which is it's not due unto others as you would have due unto you. The new golden rule is that the person with the gold makes all of the rules. I think we know this right. intuitively, but we don't necessarily follow it in our practices. And it's such a it's such an easy trap to fall into, I think, to systemize and processize so many things because you think it will make it easier, mm -hmm. but in fact, it removes people from real time listening to the feedback they're getting from those buyers. Yeah. I was just having a conversation with one of my coaching clients today and she was going through her email sequences and what they sounded like. And it starts off by talking about her product and her company. And the thing is, is that that's probably how her company trained her, right? You, you get hired, you go into a new role. The first thing they start teaching you about is the problem. I'm sorry, the product. And right. what we should be doing is immersing our selves and our sellers and our leaders into the buyer's world. Because what you teach is what they're going to preach. And so if you're starting them off talking about product and features and benefits, that's what they're going to start off talking to their buyers about. And there's studies and research after everything else that tells us that's not what buyers want to hear. They want to hear from salespeople and business owners who are going to help them to think differently about the way they're going about solving a particular challenge or problem. And we can't do that if we're doing product pitches. No, no. They want you to listen to their problem and give a solution. They want you to listen first, right? Like yes. there was a, a, a survey done by LinkedIn a few years ago. Uh, they called it their buyer first survey, which is ironic. And the thing that they found is that active listening was the number one trait that buyers look for in sellers. And uh, Deb Calvert actually wrote a book as well that they did surveys of over 500 B2B buyers and found the exact same thing. And that when managers, though, are looking to hire salespeople, active listening was the last skill that they actually looked for. They look for things like attention to detail and problem solving, which is great. But if you're not actively listening, none of those other things matter. Right. So if you shuffle that to the top skill, everything else will fall out of it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. 
Oh, that's interesting. And I think that, you know, we sometimes we, we uh, get afraid to let people have the autonomy to understand how to do that listening, and then to, you know, do their job in the coming back from it. Mm -hmm. um, because that will vary by person mm -hmm. and, and like their approach and that sort of thing. So it can be a little bit, you know, feel a little risky to that yeah. small business. Well, and there's the reality as well that um, there was a book written by uh, Dr. Thomas, I'm forgetting his last name, but the name of the book is Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders? <laughs> okay. Love the title of the book. And what yeah. he said was, is that society rewards us for self-promotion, for talking about ourselves. And our brains reward us for talking about ourselves. Like we get all of the feel good hormones and emotions when we start to talk about the things that we care about and what we know. And as a result, we we verbally vomit all over people sometimes, right? Like we all know that person that you go into a room and all of a sudden everything is all about them. It's kind of why I wear this t-shirt. Um, <laughs> and so it's it's counterintuitive to us to hold back and not talk about ourselves and not talk about what we know. And it's almost like you have to proverbially sit on your hands, close your mouth, take a pause and reflect on what someone is actually saying and then repeating it back to them. It's a skill that we need to learn because it doesn't come to us naturally. No, it doesn't come to us naturally. And there's that piece of, you know, so if I understood you correctly and you're back to them with something, right? And uh, that was actually, interestingly, a big part of the training that we got when I did my coaching certification. Mm -hmm. Is that real level three listening and really immersing yourself in, you know, what it is somebody has to say? Yeah, I learned it or I was forced to learn it by working in restaurants. Um, and if, if anyone's ever worked in a restaurant, then and you've worked the front of the house, which is, you know, bartending, customer facing, waiting tables. And then there's the back of the house, which is, you know, the kitchen where all of the stuff happens. And what I learned in working in restaurants is that you always need to repeat back what you heard because there's so much stuff going on. It's moving at such a fast pace. You've got angry, hungry people, you know, hangry people out there, you know, barking things at you. And so I learned in a you know rather embarrassing way that if you go back to the kitchen and shout something out but don't wait to hear if they actually heard you it's like you never even said it at all the other thing is it helps to cement it in our own brains as well and and we hear things but we don't always hear them as they actually are and so like you said that repeating back of so what i hear you saying is this and then asking the question did i get it right is there anything that you would change or anything that you would add to that before we move on to the next question? We just plow right through. As soon as we hear a pain point, it's like, oh, I can solve that. I can do this for you and I can do that for you. And 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 we are completely out of the realm of where they're at. Right. We pull out our arsenal of solutions and start firing them at people exactly. without really listening. Yeah. yeah. And we wonder why we miss the mark. Right. And this applies to leadership as well. And I think that's the thing about this is that if leaders can set the example and how they interact with their teams, that is exactly what your teams are going to then model with their buyers. Um, there's a, in my practice in coaching, I do an assessment of salespeople. And this assessment is done by objective management group. They have over 2 million salespeople that have taken it over 30 years on like, I don't know, 21 different competencies. And I wanted to find out how does management actually impact their sales team? Like we hear that saying, um, as goes the manager, so goes the team. I wanted to see how, right. how that actually impacted us in sales. And so when I looked at, I think it was over 500,000 managers and the salespeople that reported to them, the thing that I found is that when management had certain um, so hangups or inhibitions or mindsets, that they are up to a thousand percent more likely to pass that on to their teams. So your teams are looking to you as the example. And if you're not actively listening to them, they're not going to be able to actively listen with their buyers because they don't even know what that looks or sounds like. Yeah. And so what happens with leadership when a team adopts this process? How does how does that sort of flow upward in organizations? So there's there is some data around that as well. And so when teams are actively listening and 
what is the foundation of collaborative selling, of consultative selling is active listening because it allows us to ask really good thought provoking questions because we're in the present moment with them, right? We're not thinking about what to say next. We're not thinking about how I'm gonna handle this objection or not like listening for something we can respond to. What happens is that uh, it's easier to build trust with your buyers. It's easier to collaborate with them. And what I've seen is that it can impact sales anywhere between 25 and 50% in an increase in what they can actually do. And when a leader has been trained and coached on how to coach this, their team gets 49% more skills than teams that don't. And if you think about the impact that 49% more skills would have on your sales pipelines and in your process and your acquisition of customers, the number's a little bit mind blowing because we've looked at you know, on a bell curve of how much of a skill increase impacts revenue. And if you were to take that and look at it, like a 10% increase in revenue for every you know, 10% increase in skills, that's huge for an organization, especially now mm -hmm. as it's getting harder and harder to get buyers to respond to us, largely because we don't actually listen to them. Right. I think it's also probably important for the engagement of the employees. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't necessarily work in the engagement employees era, but just in working with my own clients and managers, it helps to build that trust within the team itself. It helps to uh, build that camaraderie that I've got your back instead of it being the, you know, I, I almost look at, at middle managers as you're the buffer between all of the stuff that's rolling downhill and your team. You need to almost create a bubble around them so that they're not having to deal with all of the politics of the office and can focus and be fully present with their buyers. So, and it happens at every level of the organization from, you know, VP to CEO, from manager to VP and from manager to their individual contributors. Right, right. So there's that cascade effect. Yeah, the domino effect, I call it. Yeah. And so tell me, how did you come to like you're doing lots of things, obviously, in this space? How did you come to decide to go for it with the book? I told my husband that this is that if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, this is my strategy to make sure that everybody can learn from all of the mistakes that I made to get here. <laughs> you know, like, here's this pothole, look out for it because it's going to really do a number on your front end kind of a thing. And so for me, it was, I wanted to be able to write this book because I, I had such a transformative experience when I shifted my own mindset about what sales was and what it wasn't. When I started to realize that selling isn't something that we do to other people, it's something that we do with them. It was such right. a transformative experience for me, both in my personal life and in my business, that I felt that there's so many business owners out there that are struggling right now that they need this. And I've earned the stripes over the last 20 years. I feel like if somebody else, if one other person can avoid some of the mistakes that I made and those sleepless nights and worrying how they're going to pay the mm -hmm. bills, then I feel like I've left a good mark on the world. And I think at the end of the day, you look at the numbers of all of the people who have left their jobs since the pandemic. There's over 4.7 million in the last quarter, I think, that left. And out of those, almost 2 million of them are going to start their own businesses. They have no plans to go back to the workforce. And that is a, a market of people, a group of people who are gonna probably have to figure this out sooner rather than later. My hope is that they can take this book and apply some of that to their daily lives. So that again, they, they can avoid some of those sleepless nights that a lot of us have gone through. Yeah, yeah, and to pass that wisdom on. And I mean, 25 to 50% increase in sales is significant. Yeah. Very well, significant. It's, it's the difference between barely scraping it together and actually realizing the dream that business owners have of being able to control their calendar and have a work-life balance of some sort. And for the most part, though, I find that a lot of business owners, they started their business because they have a passion for something. They want to see a change happen in the world. They want to make the world a better place. They didn't go into it with a mindset of I'm a salesperson. Like how many people when you say, hey, you're a great salesperson, make that face like. Ugh, really? Okay. I want to change that because sales is life. Sale, we all of us are selling every day, right? Like whether you're a parent trying to convince a kid to eat the vegetables or a leader who's trying to convince your team or an employee who's trying to make a case for resources, we sell all the time. 
we just have this perception of what sales is because of the history of it as being this pushy, slimy, sleazy tactics where you have to manipulate and convince in order to get what you want. And that's not it at all. It's actually a collaborative conversation between two people to understand a problem and solve it. And isn't that how we make the world a better place? Yeah, definitely it is. I just I think of that piece of yeah, like as you rise in the ranks and become more senior, you need to have influence and really, you know, that's a that is a kind of sales. It's yeah. just that we don't often think about, you know, what are those pieces that go around sales that we use in ways that might not end in a dollar sign. Yeah. Selling is an exchange of value. And in order to have the exchange of value, you have to understand what value is to the other person. Again, making it all about them. Value is in the eye of the buyer, the golden rule, the new golden rule. And so, and, and it applies to leadership and management. So it's not just about being buyer first. It's about being seller first if you're a manager. It's about being manager first if you're a leader that is managing those people. It's essentially, I think the world would be just such a better place if we took the focus off of ourselves and what we wanted and put the focus on how can I help someone else? How can I make it about them? Negotiations, everything else becomes so much more easier when we can think that way. Yeah, definitely. I think it makes so much sense to me. Um, and also that everybody can learn something from that process. Yeah. You know, whether you think you're selling or not in a direct sales role at all, um, that everyone can learn something from, you know, figuring out where that exchange of value is, how to listen really well and what to do with it. Yeah. And as, and, and as a result of listening really well, that's where all of our best questions come from. Because like, if you're not in the present moment, you're not even hearing what the other person is saying. And, and I've listened to enough sales calls to see it happen firsthand. And what happens is that when that, when buyers don't feel that they're being heard, they check out, they're not even there anymore. I mean, think of the last time that you tried to have a conversation with a teenager who was on their cell phone. They're not actively <laughs> listening. And that's how we appear to our buyers. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. You think of that scenario. Yeah. You get on the call, you spin up the sales deck and off you go. Right. And and so how do you take something that you do every day, maybe many, many times and give it that fresh spin every time you come at it? Yeah. Um, yeah. I had I had one client that I worked with. Uh, that was a family owned software business. And uh, the gentleman that I worked with was the only salesperson in the company. And they did um, emergency, uh, they did EMT uh, sort of do documentation on a mobile platform. So literally their software helped to save lives because people in ambulance would be able to then document the case history, send it quickly to the hospital before they even got there. Literally their software saved lives. And the gentleman that I work with, he was an EMT of themselves. He knew everything about the industry and the pain points of the buyer. But if you were to listen to his demos, and he said this, not me. He's like, after listening to my demo, it's like the other person didn't even need to be there. You could tell that he'd done it a million times before. So right. despite the fact that he had all of this knowledge, the fact that he wasn't actively listening and collaborating with his buyers didn't make any difference how much he knew. When he right. started to actively listen and ask thought provoking questions and challenge and push back, all of a sudden he started to see this turnaround that happened in their business. And today they're, they've now hired more salespeople. Their company is growing. So this has a real impact and not only in how we're able to sell more, but how we relate to people every day. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so interesting because. I think, you know, you think it's your job. It's easy to think that it's my job to have all those answers. And so mm -hmm. therefore I am a large repository of facts and information, yeah. but, but it has to couple up with that really good listening and asking of questions because everybody's yeah. situation is a little different. Exactly. When I was coaching um, Harvard students, the first year that I did it, um, the students would do a role play. It would get videoed. They would go back and listen to it. And then I would coach them through that. And I remember that first round of students that I talked to, they hardly asked like maybe one or two questions. And then they went right into their pitch. And so I would ask them like, well, how did you think that you did on your video? And their response was, well, I think I did great. I controlled the call. I gave the pitch and the value proposition and it was great. Yeah. Not great. <laughs> like they actually thought that their job was to not ask questions. And when I would push back, they're like, well, if I ask a lot of questions, don't they, won't they think that I don't know? what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I was like, 
again, it's not about the knowledge. It's about what is it that you can ask and learn about your buyer and how they perceive things first. And then you can display what your competencies are, but not until you've fully understood what's going on in their world, because they probably have a different perspective of it. Yeah. Yeah. And it is one of, it's a skill asking questions that you need to practice and learn as well. And that's the beauty of it is that you can practice it on anybody around you. Um, I oftentimes when I have, I, and I did this myself, when I needed to learn how to better actively listen and how, when I needed to learn how to ask better questions, I was at a point in my business where I didn't have any buyers or prospects to talk to yet. So I'm like, well, how am I going to practice these conversations? And I had a sales coach at the time and he said, you got people around you that you talk to, you can practice on them. You can practice it in everyday conversations. So my Uber driver, the cashiers, the waitresses, they all became participants in my practicing of active listening and asking really good questions. And I will warn you that when you do start to do this with people around you, do not be surprised when you start hearing life stories <laughs> that right. go on for a while. Like you'll probably hear things and learn things about people that you never would have known before. So just be right. forewarned that that may happen. But it's interesting too how it plays out in our personal lives. Like when I was going through the process, I remember at one point my kids looked at me and they're like, you know what, mom, you yell a lot less than you used to. Mm. That was a little gut wrenching for me. But also at the same time, I realized how powerful just this simple thing can be. So just stop talking, mm -hmm. take a pause, repeat back what you heard, and then ask a question about what it is that you heard. You can do that with anybody around you at any time. Yeah. And I'm not surprised it leads you to deep conversations. Right. Exactly. Because I think mm -hmm. people start to see that you really do actually care. And if you go yeah. into it with a, with a mindset of curiosity and caring of what the other person thinks, that intention comes through in your tone of voice, in how you hold yourself, and even in the questions that you ask. Yeah, definitely. That You can always tell when someone's genuine and when they're really present with you. Yeah, you feel yeah. it. And, and I yes. guess it's harder to do sometimes through online and through video, but there are things that you can do there that uh, will still bring that across. Um, I think this is something that all of us, given today is, you know, the, 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 the day that we're memorizing uh, Juneteenth and, and all of these things in the state yes. that our country is in right now. I think that if, if people could just shut up and listen, <laughs> it would be so much easier and better. Yeah. So helpful. So helpful. I think that's a really great piece of advice. <laughs> now <laughs> your new t-shirt will say, shut up and listen. Up and listen yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I'll be on the back. It's not about yeah. you. There shut you up. go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, when can we look forward to the book, Carol? So the book is coming out fall of next year. Um, and actually, if anyone is listening, I am uh, recruiting for advanced readers right now. The only requirement is, is that you're either a business owner who sells or manages sales or you're an individual seller in a company and you've never worked with me before. So if you're listening to this, please direct message me. I have about 10 slots open for my advanced readers um, that I'm hoping to get some feedback for and as to how the exercises work and so forth. So if you want to be the first to see an advanced copy of Buyer First before next year, hit me up on LinkedIn. Fantastic. Good. Well, you can find Carol. She'll be linked in the post that uh, comes after this live broadcast. And you can also search her on LinkedIn. You'll find her. And thank you so much for joining me today on behalf of Paula. That's be a great chat. And uh, here's to more listening. Thank you so much. And I do have to give a quick plug for Julie's book as well, because the things that we're talking about here is behavioral change. And in order for you to make a behavior change happen, You've got to have a really deep, personally meaningful goal that are going to put your feet on the floor every morning to bridge that gap. So definitely check out Julie's book if you're looking to make these kinds of changes, because that's the first step. Very good. Thank you so much. And my book, Big Gorgeous Goals, is available on Amazon. Yay. So, thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much, Carol. Take care. And thanks for joining me. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Julie. Okay. Bye. Bye.